Over the course of the Middle Ages, there have been many a treaty, alliance, or diplomatic relations between nations, kingdoms, and peoples all over the world. One of these in particular spanned hundreds of years, and to some, still lives on to this day. From its humble beginnings in the year 1295, to its eventual but perhaps unofficial dissolution in 1560, the oldest alliance in history is what I will explore with you today. Now as a quick disclaimer, I'm going to cover lots of different names of people and places. I'll try to take it slow and use visual aids to keep a cohesive flow of information, but if you get stuck at all, just pause the video and take a second to process. Let us begin. You could say it began with the death of Scotland's seven-year-old queen, Margaret, the Maid of Norway. It was at this time that Edward I of England, also known as the infamous Edward Longshanks, saw his chance to assert dominance over Scottish lands. In response, the Council of Twelve, a temporary governing body in absence of a ruler, desperately sought alliances wherever they could to avoid English rule. Coincidentally, Philip IV of France was making moves against England and Gascony, province in southwestern France and northwestern Spain. With this knowledge, Scotland's next move was clear, and they sent ambassadors to France, resulting in the Treaty of Paris on October 23, 1295. The treaty clearly favored the French, whose only obligation was to continue their campaign in Gascony, but this alliance was more symbolic than actual at this point, and it had a positive impact on the impoverished Scots morale. Unfortunately, as is often the case with history, this treaty did all but nothing to stop the hammer of the Scots, Edward I, from sweeping through in 1296 and all but eradicating Scottish independence. On top of this, conflict between France and England was put on hold in 1299 with the Treaty of Perpetual Peace and Friendship, meaning now Edward could focus all efforts on wiping out the Scots. This dark time was not without its share of heroes, however, for it was during this time that the legendary William Wallace and his compatriots ignited the fire that grew into the First Scottish War of Independence. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, you may already be familiar with the character of Sir William Wallace and how he earned the title Guardian of Scotland. In 1297, after killing the English High Sheriff of Lanark, Wallace joined the forces of William the Hardy, Lord of Douglas, and together carried out the Raid of Scone. In September of the same year, Wallace met with Andrew Moray, and together they won the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Though heavily outnumbered, the Scots kept English forces trapped on Stirling Bridge, killing any infantry who crossed and eventually forcing them back with a phalanx formation against their own heavy cavalry. The sheer weight caused the bridge to collapse, drowning the retreating English soldiers and bolstering the confidence of the Scottish ranks. Despite this victory, in the Battle of Falkirk the following year, Wallace suffered a crushing defeat, resulting in his resignation as Guardian. The title was granted to Robert the Bruce, but Wallace continued his fight against the English, evading capture until August 4, 1305, when John de Menteith, a fellow Scottish knight, betrayed his people and turned Wallace over to the English. Wallace was taken to Westminster Hall in London and tried for treason, a crime he was perhaps innocent of since he never really pledged loyalty to King Edward in the first place. Regardless, he was found guilty of multiple egregious charges and sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. A brutal type of capital punishment where the victim is hung by the neck until nearly dead, then emasculated and eviscerated with his bowels burned before him, and then finally beheaded and cut into pieces. By the end of the war, Scotland survived thanks to heroic sacrifice, their own military cleverness, and the lack of English stratagem under Edward Longshank's successor, Edward II. In 1326, Robert the Bruce negotiated the renewal of their alliance with the French via the Treaty of Corbeil as a precautionary measure. This was just in time as in 1332, Edward III set out to fulfill his predecessor's wishes and conquer Scotland once and for all. For the first time, the Franco-Scottish alliance was in a state of emergency. In winter of that same year, Philip VI dispatched ten ships to aid Scotland's defense, but due to stormy conditions, they never arrived. In spring of 1334, the French again attempted aid in the form of a thousand pounds and an offer of sanctuary for the Queen and other court members, including the five-year-old King David II, 
the late Robert the Bruce's son and new ruler of Scotland. Much obliged, the Scottish royalty fled to France in May of the same year, while French ambassadors proposed another peace treaty with the English. Once the prospect of including Scotland was brought up, however, King Edward refused further negotiations. France continued sending supplies to Scotland, and in 1339 William Douglas, Lord of Lydesdale, arrived in France to take King David home in addition to 200 French troops and several ships, aiding in the capture of Perth, the town where Edward Longshanks first began his crusade decades before. Later in the summer of 1346, King Philip wrote to the now grown King David, urging him to attack the English forces in hope of avoiding a looming attack against his own kingdom, to which the Scots agreed and began planning a chevashi, a type of warfare technique involving the raiding, burning, and pillaging to reduce productivity in an enemy region. However, before the Scots could carry out their plan, English forces led by King Edward himself overwhelmed the French defense at the Battle of Crecy in August of that same year. Despite this, the Scottish still kept their word and launched an offensive against the English, which sadly did not end in their favor as even without their king present, the English were successful in their defense and King David was captured at the Battle of Neville's Cross. Nearly a decade later, in March of 1355, France's new king, King John II, or John the Good, commanded Sir Eugène de Garancier, pardon my French, to lead an army of 60 knights and company, a force of around 200 men, to join the Scots in attacking northern English strongholds. After a promised payment of 40,000 moutons d'or, the Scots agreed to attack. Sir William Ramsay lured English forces at Norham Castle out of their defense by frightening herds of cattle, where they walked into a perfect ambush by the French and William, Lord of Douglas. It was a decisive victory, but they'd only won the battle, not the war, and decided to withdraw to Scotland to begin an approach by sea on the beach of Berwick-upon-Tweed. That name's so cool. Although they took the city, they failed to storm Berwick Castle, and the Scots withdrew again, with the weary French army returning home after the failed siege. Over the next couple years, Scottish knights sailed to France to return the favor, one of which being the notable William Douglas, 1st Earl of Douglas, who led an army of 200 men-at-arms and 40 knights alongside the French in the Battle of Poitiers, the results of which unfortunately was utter defeat and capture of King John, as well over 2,000 French men-at-arms. To make things worse, King David's 11-year absence did not serve Scotland well as inner turmoil and political subterfuge grew worse back home until King David made a deal with Edward III to return home and consolidate power. In 1357, with the aid of Archibald Douglas, 3rd Earl of Douglas, David cut down rival barons and reinstated royal power in Scotland. In 1371, after his uncle David II's death, King Robert II took the throne and reignited the fires of war. A treaty was reinstated with Charles V of France, and in 1385, plans of a Franco-Scottish invasion of England were underway. A small battalion of French forces were to be dispatched to Scotland, but after several years, these plans were never carried out. In the words of French chronicler Jean Froissart, again, pardon my pronunciation, the people of France at this time, quote, wished the King of France would make a truce with the English for two or three years and then march to Scotland and utterly destroy it, end quote. After this deterioration of camaraderie, the two kingdoms parted ways yet again. Now, almost half a century later, during the English invasion of France in 1418, led by the renowned King Henry V, the Dauphin, Charles VII, called on Scotland for aid. Between 1419 and 1424, approximately 15,000 Scottish troops were sent to help the French defense. Together, the United Forces defeated the English in the Battle of Bauge in 1421. This was a turning point in the Hundred Years' War, but for the Scots, this victory was short-lived as their entire army was defeated in Verneuil in 1424. Despite the loss of Scottish reinforcements, it was actually thanks to them that the French war effort continued at all after this point. Five years later, the Scottish sent aid to Joan of Arc in her famous Relief of Orleans. 
and throughout the rest of the 15th century, the Franco-Scottish alliance was renewed four more times before the French victory concluding the Hundred Years' War. The aftermath of the war left England in a state of civil war known as the War of Roses. English rivals fought over who would succeed the throne, and with their threat to Scotland greatly reduced, James II took the opportunity to retake both Roxburgh and Berwick in 1460, which would ultimately cost him his life. Despite the weakened state of their long enemy, neither France nor Scotland had the appetite for any more conflict after a hundred years of fighting. When Henry VII married Elizabeth of York, England's inner turmoil came to an end with the beginning of the Tudor dynasty. To maintain peace with their old enemies, and at the dawn of what was now the 16th century, Henry VII gave his daughter Margaret Tudor to James IV of Scotland, and his younger daughter, Mary Tudor, to Louis XII of France. The Auld Alliance underwent significant change throughout the 1500s, being formally reviewed in 1512, 1517, and again in 1548. The on and off again Anglo-French and Anglo-Scottish conflict continued throughout the 16th century, but the Auld Alliance's core purpose was disappearing. As Protestantism gained traction in Scotland, they were linked more to England than to France, and in 1568, Scotland was officially a Protestant state under King James VI, who was also heir to the English throne. After more than 250 years, the treaties between Scotland and France came to an end with the signing of the Treaty of Edinburgh in July of 1560. In the following 17th century, the Auld Alliance continued on in the hearts of certain Catholic Scots, and Scotland's close relation with the French forever changed their architecture, cuisine, law, and even Scottish language, among other things. There were also many Scots who studied at French universities up until the Napoleonic Wars. In a 1942 speech by Charles de Gaulle in Edinburgh, he described the Franco-Scottish alliance as the oldest alliance in the world, stating, quote, in every combat where for five centuries the destiny of France was at stake, there were always men of Scotland to fight side by side with men of France. And what Frenchmen feel is that no people has ever been more generous than yours with its friendship. In 1995, celebrations were held to mark the 700th anniversary of the beginning of this truly historic alliance. Now, technically, unlike what the title of this video may convey, the Auld Alliance, while very old, is not factually the oldest alliance. That achievement is credited to the Anglo-Portuguese Alliance, a video for another day. Technicalities aside, I love medieval history in case you couldn't tell by the Italo-Norman helmet I wear in all my videos. It's so fascinating how different the world was back then and the efforts made by single people to leave a permanent mark on history, for better or for worse. I also trace a large part of my ancestry back to this point in time, so naturally I feel connected to these events in my own little way. If you made it this far in the video, leave a comment about your favorite part of history, or at least the time you feel most drawn to. If you want to see more videos like this, like the video so I know you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more feudal facts. I'll see you all next time.